Fresh Economic Thinking podcast. New ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. Hi, listeners. Today I'm handing most of the discussion over to Cameron because he's been dying to interview podcasting personality Misha Saul. And so take it away, Cameron. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, good morning, Misha. Thanks for coming on the show. Cameron, the, the pleasure's all mine. I've enjoyed following you and reading this stuff over, over the years, so I'm looking forward to this chat. Terrific. Yeah, we, we for those who don't know, we, we've been following each other online. Uh, Misha's got a great substack. Uh, Kvetch, is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Kvetch. That's exactly right. <laughs> And uh, does podcasts and is in finance. And but but what I really wanted to talk to Misha today about is that we seem to be in tune when it comes to some of the peculiar patterns we see in politics around family life and uh, you know traditional values versus modern even woke attitudes. And so I want to see if we can dig down into where we might uh, cross over or overlap and where we might differ on how these sorts of things sort of blend together uh, with the way we conduct economic policy. So that's where I want to go. But for our listeners, maybe, Misha, you'd like to just give us the very brief overview. Who are you? Where are you from? Uh, What do you do? I know you've got a a very interesting, um, you know, family history and all of that as well. So. Sure, I'll, I'll give you the, the kind of the 20 second version um, from Adelaide. Well, I, was, I was born in Georgia, ex Soviet Union, Georgia. Um, you know, my family moved over, you know, immigrated to this great, great country when we were when we were little, when I was little. And, you know, to Adelaide, grew up in Adelaide, went to uni in Adelaide, moved to Sydney for work. Um, and so I've been in, in finance and um, for, you know, somewhat over a decade now and, um, and, and currently investing. And uh, you probably know me more from my non-finance stuff where I just um, can't help but just kind of, um, you know, shoot my mind, <laughs> you know, run my mouth on, on Twitter. And, um, and as you know, I've got a, I've got like a blog slash newsletter substack um, called Fetch where I basically write about books um, and, and ideas that I, that I come across. And I, and by the way, I've, I've read your book rigged, which I, I recommend and Cameron did not ask <laughs> me to say that. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've got a half baked Kvetch, um, on that as well, which will be coming out at, at some point when I when I get to finishing it. <laughs> oh, terrific! I look forward to hearing that <laughs> or reading reading about it. I'm glad someone's reading the book, so that's that's great to hear, Misha. So I guess um, you know, uh, I think where where our lives sort of overlap. You have uh, two children, if I'm right, and I've got three. Uh, three. I have two boys in high school, so I've actually just been through a similar life stage and experienced, um, you know, dealing with Centrelink and, uh, you know, family payments, dealing with school and daycare and all of that. And I, um, I guess I just wanted to ask, you know, is it, is it what you expected it to be? Have there been any weird sort of um, economics lessons for you about this stage of life and has it made you more traditional in your outlook having had a family because I feel like when I see what you're writing there's you're becoming very much drawn to more traditional ideas of family and I could certainly say that I was as well when I had children and yeah so is there, is there anything jumps out to you as yeah um, maybe peculiar it's- about Australia <laughs> or your experience it's always it, it, it's always hard to know how much like like my kind of high level view like I, I look around there are many strange things and, and, and you know I, I get the sense from the way you communicate you're also in kind of constant puzzlement and bewilderment at at some of the kind mm-hmm. of things that are going on um uh, my view is that every country has its own derangements kind of political economic mm-hmm. cultural derangements and and we have our own here and so it's hard to know how much of a global versus this kind of this kind of local um although i really delight in sharing some of my skepticism with you in particular because i never know whether it's me coming you know coming at it from like immigrant outsider eyes or from like a different cultural perspective or not and so i'm actually delighted that someone like you who's kind of you know 
my, I gather kind of real deep, true blue Queenslander, um, <laughs> also kind of sh- 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 shares the bewilderment. But so, so I, I absolutely ha- like I, I'm kind of loath to tag myself politically, but I do feel I've kind of shifted, you know, way more kind of conservative and traditional as I've had family, which is a bit of a cliche, but I think it's kind of true. And and, and part of it is, um, you know, I grew up in Adelaide and, and moved to Sydney as quickly as I could, and you know. To, to pursue my dreams, move to the big smoke, all that kind of stuff, the typical kind of brain drain story out of Adelaide. And it's a very typical story. And, and on balance is, is a great, you know, great thing to do. And, but, but I think, um, you know, I think we underrate kind of local community. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of accentuated, as I've had, as I've had kids, it's accentuated, atomized uh, our kind of social um, and economic structure um, you know, structures are. And in the US, you can kind of see the agglomeration around New York and LA and maybe, you know, maybe one or two other cities, but really like two cities in, in the US. And it's a strange law of the universe um, or of culture or that that you kind of get these cities that become bigger and bigger and kind of suck, you know, you know people from everywhere else into these atomized blocks. You know, it's, it's strange that in, in Australia, we're seeing a slightly less intense version of that and and i guess you know um i think uh you know so you know, I'm, I, I, I married a mexican you know none of us are family um you know direct relatives in mm-hmm. in sydney and so um you know we're very reliant and we're not alone you know i speak for a large chunk of you know sydney siders you know um uh you know that kind of atomized living is t- is is tough but but i don't mm. just mean like like you know, what was me tough I, I just mean um it's strange that we divorce children from grandparents from extended family mm-hmm. and the like um and so uh you know parts of that I, I think are strange I think um you know child care is a strange institution where um you know I, I joke about how um uh you know yeah kibbutzim in, in Israel, these kind of socialist paradise little communes would outsource the child rearing and make it semi um, you know, anonymized back, back in the day. And, and I uh-huh. joke that, you know, socialism and kind of capitalism have converged on the same model where you outsource <laughs> parenting to these strange centers. And so um, it's strange that we kind of subsidize um, other women looking after your children, um, but we kind of um, are loathe to subsidize mothers or, or, or parents looking after uh, children and instead encourage them to go into the workforce. So we've got this obsession around female participation in the labor force and kind of getting that number up as if we were kind of totally agnostic to who looks after uh, children, we, you know, yeah. which I kind of find strange. So anyway, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, pick, no, pick whatever I, you like I'm totally with you on that. And uh, when I had my kids at daycare, um, you know, they weren't at daycare a lot. Uh, I was studying a PhD at the time. I had very similar thoughts and I actually immediately revert to thinking about the system, not just my experience in it, but the whole daycare system. And the fact that for the younger kids, the you know, the carer child ratio, I think is three children to one carer at the youngest age. And it really puzzled me because I thought, well, if you had three children, uh, prior like that were younger than school age you know you've got the same carer child ratio in your house as they have at daycare so all you're doing is you're swapping which women are doing which jobs right and all of that um, participation you're getting and i say women because they were 100 percent women at the childcare center right um you're just swapping uh which women uh are looking after the kids and calling the ones that look after them in the workforce rather than the ones that looked after them not in the workforce and therefore not doing anything because you looked after them in your home. And I, I find uh, you know, it's sort of puzzling that we overlook families as a unit, as an institution in society so often in things like childcare and even things like elderly care. Right. So people look after their parents. And I know in Asian cultures, this is much, much more important. Um, but here it's almost you know, ignored as an avenue, as, as, a, as a way that policy can be set to support the fact that families are already going to look after their, their elderly parents. Um, so I, I just found, found a lot of weird 
uh, interactions. And one of the ones that's bugging me at the moment, <laughs> you know, it's my podcast, I'll share what's bugging me, uh, is superannuation. We're having this huge debate about, you know, women don't have enough super. And we ignore the fact that almost every woman is in a house pooling resources with a man <laughs> during their lifetimes and with others. Uh, and it's almost... You know, it's ignored. And I wonder why that is. Is that an Australian thing? Is that something you are tuned into? Um, because when I know when I tweet about it or write about it, you you know, you obviously agree or you make comments or have you are you tuned into this? Is it is it something Australian? Is it you know would this happen in Georgia? <laughs> uh, do you think well um you know I, I'm certain Georgia had some derangements, you know. I um and, and, and you, my, my macro view is that, you know, despite um, all the sand in the gears, you know, in Australian society, you know, we are one of the most blessed societies um, in, in, the, in the world. And so, you know, one of my, not criticisms, and you kind of say it, but in, in your book, um, you know, you, you kind of said a few times, but like, you know, you, you point out all the kind of rent seeking across our society, but on a relative basis, I suspect rent seeking in Australia is more productive or less bad than in in most other societies and so it's hard to take it out of context it's hard to imagine mm. society that's kind of perfectly kind of thoughtful and, mm. and, and not tied to its kind of political stakeholders and so it's hard to be too um you know too dogmatic about it, although it's very valuable for someone to kind of point these issues out and, and one can be better um but i think um you know, uh, in, in terms of super, obviously, in many respects, as a kind of regulated phenomenon, it is a uniquely Australian um, uh, system. Um, uh, I guess, like, you know, I think you know, your last criticism, you know, if I were to steel man the argument, you know, women have less super at the end, a lot of the time it's because, um, you know, uh, what, what they're protecting about uh, is that minority of women who, um, you know, the, the family unit breaks up and they're suddenly mm -hmm. left in the lurch, I imagine, you know, and and, and that's mm -hmm. an understandable um, kind of concern. I, 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 I guess the whole issue is kind of tied up into the broader kind of cultural question or an economic question or political question around, um, you know, gender pay parity and and the kind of obfuscation and, 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 and the games you know, we play there. That's obviously a bit of a sensitive subject, and obviously, you know, there's a there's a very kind of um, you know political line that um, you know one 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 tends to take. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you're the you're the super kind of expert. I, I find your arguments pretty compelling, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm also kind of um, you know, I, I'm I'm in finance land, so I, to some extent, I'm a little bit um, uh, conflicted, and um, uh, you know. I, you know, uh, limited, constrained in, in terms of the, the kinds of critiques I can kind of be very aggressive about to, to be upfront. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's very interesting. I want to move on because one of the really interesting things I've noticed um, you write about or at least share ideas briefly on Twitter is, um, and and it's a bit of a trend. And and let me let me link this to something that Donald Trump actually said this year, which was we're going to build new freedom cities across America, right? Yes. And you, you've written, and I think this is a quote from you, the real great stagnation is that Australia is not teaming up with strange cults, building little Armenias or pagan pyramids or neo-Amish communes or secular kibbutzes or Mexican, I don't even know how to pronounce this word, haciendas, haciendas or Sikodes. Yes. Seek or Dallas temples across this vast land and instead choose city agglomeration and nine to five. So I want to ask you, what is this about? What, what's the thinking there? Is this just about being visionary? Is there something you've noticed that's lacking? Because, you know, I, you know I'm very receptive to big ideas, but, um, you know, sometimes big ideas mean big mistakes and waste of resources as well. So what's your thinking? Yeah. So I, I used to be like, you know, back in my uni, I used to be pretty libertarian and really lean hard into your last comment. Like, you know, we should just kind of let folks, whatever. I, I guess, you know, I, I look I look at society now and I kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm frontier starved. I, I think we are frontier starved. I, I think we are absolutely mm -hmm. stagnating. I think I kind of, um, you know, I, I, I miss 
um, you know, nostalgically never having really experienced it, but just kind of, you know, I, I miss, um, you know, the Australia that built these great uh, cities and kind of, you know, um, tamed this great land. And, you know, in more extreme, I look at, I look at the US where this kind of, um, you know, that historical wave of, you know, really kind of sweeping across uh, uh, across that great land and kind of bumping into you know domestic and foreign empires and really carving out um, a nation out of that you know I think that has kind of led us to, to where we are and I and I guess I look at Australia in particular and we are you know f- you know food rich um, and mm-hmm. secure and exporters and energy rich exporters um, you know we got we got better um, borders than than money money can buy and it's mm-hmm. strange to me that we've kind of got f- you know five cities and really two cities on the coasts and it, like, there's no law of God that said Australia shall have two cities and um and you know i i i wonder why we've kind of moved from you know building something and building something great to kind of just cr- cruising along and you know mm. see how it goes and and i guess you know i, I kind of mentioned all these cultures and different kind of models because i'm kind of you know agnostic or, or i'm sympathetic to people having different views about what the what the future looks like i'm not being dogmatic about that but like let's have a vision and and, and let, let's have a future and, and and why aren't we you know seeing strange cults and why are we seeing strange <laughs> communities um build up even internally you know like but but we're not really like like if you look around like it's really just kind of um you know like it's it's kind of nothing like we're just, and look we, we live we, we live good lives and um, you know, uh, and, and, and that's kind of fine, but like, w- w- what are people concerning themselves um, about? Why aren't we building um, so- something more? So I, I guess it, it comes from this yearning for n- new frontiers and, and, and mm. a concern that Australia is stagnating. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I think there's... Uh... A bit of a global pattern to that. I know in the US there's a lot of thoughts on why aren't we thinking bigger, why aren't we doing this? Um, and I'm very receptive to that. I think I'm a big fan of experimentation, I would say. I'm not a big fan of getting the whole of society and sort of spending a huge proportion of resources on one political, you know, statue or um, you know, boulevard for the king and uh you know, I know a lot of places in the Middle East have a tendency for failed mega projects, and that's also happening in Asia. Um, but I'm very keen on experimentation. I'm very, I guess, I'm almost proud uh, of Elon Musk's space, uh, you know, endeavors, because it almost gives me heart that you know, when when there's enough energy and motivation and people and money that come together, we can still do pretty radical things that expand our horizons. Um, have you got a take on Elon Musk? Because he's a bit of a controversial figure now. He's gone from a bit of a, and I think I've mentioned this, a bit of a lefty climate hero into some kind of right-wing villain conspiracy person and i've been there the whole way sort of keeping it on the you know the the great the the electric cars and this you know solar roofs and all of that and it you know to me that's a real insight maybe the culture's stopping us from doing anything big because when someone does it you know is the tall poppy thing stopping that or do you think if a government got involved we would all just toe the line because we're aussies do you have any thoughts there Yes, I mean, look, Elon um, has a, you know, a lot of um, you know hot, hot air, but he's also just de- de- delivered a ton. And so I'm absolutely, you know, I, I think we can, I, I think um, you know, we should overlook a whole lot of sins for folks who just get out there and, and do stuff. And so, <laughs> you know, and, and frankly, lefties, if they're policy oriented, they should be grateful that he's kind of right coding you know, all these ideas, because it basically means that their ideas are seeping and bleeding in, into the right. Mm-hmm. But of course, that's not really how these tribal things work. But like, you know, theoretically, they, they should be, you know, really pleased. I, I guess like, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't think Australia should go, um, you know, 
solar panels and, and that's it or, or, or something, you know, like mm. or, or whatever statue that, that kind of attracts it. I, I think your idea of experimentation is great, you know, to the extent it's government, to the extent it's kind of decentralized, you know, a lot of times governments just get out of the way and, and give, give folks a, a crack. I'll give you one grand example to give you something solid. It, it's only one and, and there are a million others, but one thing I'll, I, you know, I kind of wrote about in 2019 during the Hong Kong riots and i i thought oh, yeah. you know why don't we build a new hong kong in australia um you know why don't we invite a couple million Hongkongese, um you know into you know build a new hong kong in darwin newcastle geelong wollongong wherever find mm-hmm. declining city x anywhere you know obviously the locals need to kind of consent all this kind of stuff but like why don't why is that um a crazy idea like even me saying that now you're like you know what what, what is going on mm-hmm. here but you know hong kong speak english wealthy educated we shared the same high court until something like 1975 the privy council <laughs> in, in, in the uk common law you know so all these kind of cultural um legal linguistic financial reasons but like the idea is nuts but this has happened many times you know the I- irish waves into the u.s mm-hmm. you know the, the the much later soviet waves in, into the u.s you know we had small you know we got the the the, the largest um greek population in, in melbourne outside of yeah. you know greece um you know why um why is that crazy why can't we build a, a, a you know an entirely new city um and, and so like I, I guess you know maybe that's a bad idea for some reason, whatever. But like I, I guess even those kinds of, although I still find it like very charismatic. But like you know, you know that's the kind of thing that, that I'm talking about. Yeah, look, that's a super interesting thought experiment. Uh, a new Hong Kong at Newcastle because Hong Kong's a port city, and so is Newcastle, and uh, I know they want to expand the port there. Uh, and uh, you know, it's well, I, uh, I, I chose those regions, it's intriguing because right? A, they're declining, they've got universities, <laughs> you know, they've got ports, they've got existing infrastructure effectively. Um, and, and they're worried about you know, they're being already subsidized slightly as a regional town. So, surely, there's a regional town in Australia that wants to prosper. Um, and you know, and so, like, you know. To, Choose X. I, I, it doesn't really matter. You know, Frio. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it does Darwin. Whatever. But like, it, it, yeah. The, like you got all this great infrastructure. It could be something great. You know. I, I think. Um. You know. I tweeted something that people got annoyed about. You know. Why can't Australia have a hundred million population? Why can't we build something great? And and it need not be slums. Like I'm not talking about favelas and the future of Australian mm-hmm. favelas. You know. Um. I I think if you described Australia as it looks like today to folks 200 years ago, they think you're a NASA, you know, like it was yeah. the, the kind of the bum hole of the world. <laughs> and so <laughs> on, you know, on the other side. And so, um, and so, you know, I think in the same way, we kind of lacking, um, you know, what is actually physically stopping us from building something um, grand together. That's kind of accretive and valuable to existing mm. citizens as well as new ones. Misha, you might know this. The, there's a book, called, a novel called The Yiddish Policeman's Union, which speculates about an alternative by Michael Chabon, which speculates about an alternative history where uh, the, the Israel was never created and the Jews of Europe ended up in Alaska. And there's a small yeah. town called Sitka in Alaska, which is like the Yiddish-speaking <laughs> country of the world. Nice. Well, you know, it's not that crazy. Like, I mean, um, Jews ending up in like in in shtetls in Eastern Europe's kind of equally as bizarre, frankly, or a- anywhere else in the world. And obviously, there were all these plans either by the by Jewish en- enemies of the Jews or Jews themselves to you know postulate about a in Israel in uh, Australia or Madagascar or Uganda or other locations. Actually, so like that's not crazy at all, in in my view. Do you think, um, Misha, uh, that the one of the barriers to this is actually a broader cultural sort of um, pattern that we see that motivates sort of the NIMBY attitude or the closed borders sort of attitude? So I've always been, you know, tr- fairly moderate about things. I, I think probably with immigration, there's an optimal number. It's probably not 400,000 per year, but it's definitely not zero um and people have a hard time 
grasping that you, you know someone's not taking an extreme position but do you think there's there's that culture in Australia and do you have a view on you know how we might change that whether you think whether there's benefits to it um, because you know as you said earlier as you've had children and become more entrenched in your local environment you sort of begin to value the sort of local network as it exists today mm-hmm. rather than you know wanting it sort of completely transformed at a rapid pace into a new little Hong Kong in your neighborhood. So how do you reconcile those two sort of cultural things where uh, as a big picture perspective, we should be trying, you know, to rapidly change and improve, but then there's this huge incentive to preserve what we've got. You got any so thoughts I, I, on that? I, yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a deep question and people tend to kind of be extremes on one and the other. I, I'm kind, I think I'm kind of with you in the sense that um, I'm actually deeply sympathetic to both, you know, like if someone says, Misha, we should shut off immigration today to make it zero and enjoy the fruits of this land. I think that is a legitimate view. You know, I don't, like, I, I think people are too quick to cast to get those folks, um, you know, as troglodyte, economic troglodytes or as racist or something. I actually think it's a totally legitimate outcome. Uh, like, pe- people are allowed to choose that. I do think the government is having, is is running a fast one by the Australians on that. Like, even if I agree with the policy, Australians don't really vote for that. Like, mm-hmm. business basically just turns up the handle <laughs> immigration because it's good for them. And like, no, and both parties are kind of um, bought in on that and no one takes to the Australian public. You know, we have the highest um, immigration rate in the advanced world. Um, and again, like, it's probably good. You know, it's probably bad for some places like parts of Sydney and Melbourne. Um, but like, you know, yeah. I, like my view aside, I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic with, with a broad range of, of, of views here. I think like on your question around children changing my views, you know, I think it's a really deep question because actually society is going a different way. People having fewer kids and having them later. And I worry mm. about that. Like, I feel like um, a lot of people listening to this conversation or my views on kind of family as the fundamental unit of society and like they'll they'll just hear a really curmudgeonly grumpy <laughs> old dad dude do you know what i mean and um and and i i do think uh, voices like mine are going to be increasingly irrelevant and seen as out of touch in fact i already am frankly on, on many subjects because society's changing in another way and um and i do think it's a bit scary you know i mean i think um you know grandparents being robbed of grandkids i didn't really appreciate that like before i had kids it never occurred to me i got to i mean like really only loosely i got to you know give you know kids to my parents or whatever yeah. grandkids to my parents but like once you have them there you can you see like the purpose of their lives kind of yeah. um, you know manifest and you see the value grandparents bring to your kids and um that's kind of invisible to us now strangely it was invisible to me before i had kids but it's so important and that and those kinds of things are going away i've got cousins and friends you know um who you know their parents desperately wanted grandkids and they're not gonna ever have them now and it is a curse on their lives that they don't have grandkids anymore so i think those perspectives are, are are changing in terms of your question around this australian kind of culture you know, I mean, as I said, I'm sympathetic to kind of both ways. I, I have been reflecting on Australian culture a lot. I, I, I am, um, I guess, COVID and everything afterwards really mm. hit home to me just how much Australians culturally love Big Daddy. You know, they love being <laughs> told what to do. You know, in New South Wales. Um, you know, city siders were allowed to go and have a wine in the park during COVID. You know, because um, uh, pubs whatever was shut down and and that disappeared you know quick smart you know we we're given a treat and it is yeah. just totally mind-boggling that we can't have a you know i don't even want a glass of, i don't really drink very much but that someone can't have wine outside or we are so overregulated to 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 the nth degree this kind of mythology of the larrikin australians total rubbish yep. we absolutely line up in step with what the kind of anglo state once as opposed to the us which is has a genuine kind of historic rebellious streak for a range of reasons 
Yeah, I, I think that's totally true. And one of the one of the puzzling things I find is although that's true, but it's true in many very successful, coherent, high income countries that people are just very good at conforming. If you go to um, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, right? Everybody will line up and tell you exactly where to stand. And, and you know, there's That's all true. those unwritten rules that are socially enforced uh, like nothing else. So you do need a little bit of that. But at the same time, you know, just you know, almost dis- despite this conformity or this big daddy love that we have, we're actually probably the world's best culture at integrating migrants from almost anywhere, which I don't think many people appreciate they see maybe Pauline Hanson or a few people having a whinge. And as we said, you know, it's legitimate to have a whinge from time to time. We don't vote for this stuff. But at the end of the day, um, Australia's got more foreign-born people than anywhere, and there's essentially zero conflict on the street. There's nothing. Um, And it's this invisible success that we've had through just sort of I don't know. I don't know why it is. I mean, I, I'm a couple of generations Australian, so I don't have a good sort of perspective elsewhere. But you know, my attitude is I generally don't care. I think perhaps sport is really a big thing. We're a bit can be a bit sport obsessed, and I know with my kids, it, it, you know, sport has integrated everybody. You know. Uh, in in their friendship groups and their lives, um, but what? So so I just wanted to then sort of link that to the debate we're having now in politics. We're great at integrating everyone from everywhere because we just almost see through it. Like we have a few beat ups now and then in the AFL about race, um, but on the whole, very very um, world's best. But now we're having this debate about a voice in parliament or a, a constitutional change to separate um an indigenous voice from everyone else and i find this pretty peculiar and i'm just going to share a quick story with you and then get your view because i know you've commented on it so a couple of years back i proposed that we should treat housing like hospitals and schools and have a public option for people a cheap one so that you know if you're squeezed in the rental market you always have this option i called it housemate and i got a call from an indigenous leader who said they really liked my idea and they should adopt it for indigenous housing and they said to me which is completely unexpected but we'd have to separate all the tribes and clans they can't all live together we'd have to have each clan would have to be separated because they hate each other and they're fighting (laughs) and i was just completely shocked because the idea for that public housing system was based on Singapore, where they in fact have racial quotas that force the Malay, Chinese and Indian to all live in the same building complex so that they get to know each other, they intermarry, they you know work in the same um, businesses and socialise together to, to do what Australia does, which is integrating. So I just found it weird, this um, sort of double standard of integration versus separation when it comes to this voice. And you know, what's what's your take as, on that as as you know, someone from an immigrant background who's also you know meant to be one of these minorities who who need representation? Yeah. So um, look, uh, a, a lot lot to unpick that. I think um, I totally agree with you. Australia is world. Cl- I've not been to a place that's better at integrating you know the sheer volume of of, of immigrants. Um, I actually think um, it does come back to something we spoke about how Australians love Big Daddy, that thing around um, we're actually quietly um, quite a, um, you know, strong Anglo culture um, and that Anglo kind of, you know, regulatory slash cultural norm is actually, you know, meaningful, you know, strongly enough enforced. Um, and yeah, m- maybe manifest in sports and, and other ways. Um, but I think it, it's, it's quite, it's, it goes quite deeply and it's quite, it's quite successful. And I think it's a, it's a huge plus, um, basically, um, you know, on, on the voice, um, I guess before I go to the voice, cause you know, I feel very strongly about it as, as you mm-hmm. probably know, I think, um, I think the question of segregation generally is really interesting. You know, I, I grew up in the mythology of kind of multiculturalism and all that kind of stuff in Australia, which no one really talks about multiculturalism as much. I don't really know why, but, um, but, you know, <laughs> I think, um, 
you know, again, I, I, I'm kind of sympathetic to both views. If you told me Singapore kind of integrates all these, I'd be like, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. You, you don't want like French belieus and kind of, you know, concrete blocks full of immigrant kind of criminal communities effectively. Like it's, it's a disaster. Um, but then, um, you know, I, I live near Chatswood and Chatswood is basically, you know, one of Australia's most Chinese um, suburbs. And it just strikes mm-hmm. me as enormously successful and fine um and um you know like and and australia is a strange mix of um you know both uh kind of cultural persistence where you've kind of got very meaningful greek communities for example um and uh you know and they've had a broader influence but they're very australian at the same time and and Mm -hmm. you know i'm not really sure kind of how to describe that synthesis and what that community looks like but it strikes me as very successful as well or um you know Mm. i i go to synagogue every week and you know so i i live in some respects you know synagogues are inherently a segregated space you know jews go to synagogues okay um and i'm okay with that as well you know i i think i think there is space um both for effectively segregated cultural communities and 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 if in indigenous tribes want to live with their tribes people i'm deeply sympathetic with that I, I you know i'm i probably would not angle to force kind of cultural in, integration i think like i don't know I, i'm I, i'd kind of I, my my impulse would be to de- to devolve to whatever they they want to do basically um that's kind of my mm. my, 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 my my gut instinct and and so i've kind of given this messy answer where it's kind of <laughs> best of both worlds where i'm saying segregation is kind of underrated you know like um so clarence thomas is a supreme court judge in the u.s the the um he, and he's uh, he's been there for a while he's, uh, um, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a black man he was kind of involved in the um mm-hmm. you know civil rights issues uh back in the day he said you know the problem um with, with with segregation was not that we didn't have enough white kids in our class it's that we didn't have enough resources and i thought that was mm. a very deep comment you know um and um and and I, and I think you know if you look at look at the us um you know a lot of um successful black cultural milieus are done because they they want to hang out with other cool blacks right and mm. um and and that's okay um and so i guess um, I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in a mixed mind about um, the, the virtues of segregation, like obviously voluntary segregation yeah. um, and communal segregation versus um, kind of forced integration. O- on your point about the voice, yeah, um, you know, I think um, it's you know, again, I grew up in the, in the '90s where the, the, the aspiration was that we look beyond. Um, race and that yeah it's not the content um it's, it's not the color of your skin it's the kind of content of your character that's obviously not a 90s thing that's a Martin, yeah. Martin Luther King thing but but um uh and I, I just think um it is such a betrayal of the Australian ethos and project to um basically elevate uh you know racial um prejudice or uh, or racial uh, dif- differentiation into um, a uh, you know race agnostic legal constitutional document that, that, mm. that is the constitution and so um you know I, I think all the arguments um you know if, if people want to kind of um factually acknowledge that um, indigenous folks were here uh, you know before and have some sort of tribute to that you know okay I guess that's part of our culture and that's what people want to do that's kind of fine but in terms of I, I think all the kind of structural mechanical arguments that are put forward around um you know it lets it lets indigenous people have a voice i mean they, they have the same voice you and i have you know like i don't feel greeks have insufficient voice because you know greeks aren't elevated or you know mm-hmm. georgians or jews aren't sufficiently elevated. you know we all we're all in the same boat um mm-hmm. and so i and, and then you know obviously indigenous folks um you know suffer you know indigenous communities suffer enormous disadvantage today you know and it just a surreal step to think that um you know the constitution's the issue the constitution is like yeah. the last <laughs> issue um you know like uh, it, it's, it's just total um madness and so and, and and for them to get on their high horse about elevating race and ethnicity into our you know into our you know, ethnicity blind constitution it just really um it really upsets me yeah look i think uh i think i'm 
on board. I, I don't. I, I think what you just said that to imagine that what's what, what's written in this document or that some different person in a parliament is going to radically change the material conditions on the ground, especially in remote communities. Um, seems a little perverse to me it's almost like intentionally avoiding uh the tough issues yes. on the ground that might involve policing but might involve actually spending a lot of money uh it might involve a lot of, you know paying a lot of people to to live there and you know teach students and um you know really invest in in integrating the culture and, and uplifting it uh so uh, to me it it just feels like an excuse to appear to be doing something without actually having to do anything. And in the process, uh, uh, sort of fueling the urban lefty academic culture class, right? It's going to give them lots to talk about. It's going to create a new class of, you know, people who declare you Indigenous or non-Indigenous or, you know, there's going to be a whole cottage industry of gaming that uh, sort of paper political process. And, you know, remote communities, Indigenous communities are going to have the exact same material conditions <laughs> that they've had. Uh, so you know, I, it's, it's, I, it's I bizarre to me. That, and, and I'm really sympathetic to that view. I think if we were just that, like, again, you know, I think that's what like a preamble in the constitution would do. And I'd be supportive for, for like another symbolic bullshit act that doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Fine. Okay. Like that, that's what people want. If, if, I don't, you know, if academics want to kind of talk about that, whatever. Okay. I, I'm, I'm more concerned about creating another bureaucratic superstructure that is actually yeah. worse than nothing. Um, that actually, yep. um, you know, it, it just sucks in more cash um, to kind of you know bureauc- line bureaucratic pockets rather than go to front lines. You know, I, you know, I don't have the answers obviously to kind of how yeah. to fix indigenous disadvantage in communities. Uh, we spend like thirty or forty billion dollars a year on it. I, I don't know if we double or triple that if we will put a dent in anything. I have no idea. You know, plausibly mm-hmm. there are structural reasons. You know, like um, you know, our civilizations were built in urban centers not in the desert, okay? And so, or, you know, so like, you know, so, you know, maybe it's just impossible to actually really fix disadvantage in in those communities. Um, I'm not sure uh, as they currently exist. So maybe there's something more radical. I actually don't know. I I guess um, I just know that, you know, this kind of, um, you know, this whole uh, fake idea that, um, you know, there's this, sovereign nation within a nation like it, yeah. it's just like guys we're all part of the australian project um and kind of let's get on with it let's try and fix the issues um but um you know i i don't know i i, I guess if you take it to, to to the extremes you know if indigenous people really like if they wanted an israel in australia if they wanted to go out and carve out darwin or something and kind of make it their mm. own and, and and find sovereignty and and you know we can't talk about them as, as kind of um homogenous block but as you noted previously you know yeah. they're not homogenous they're made of lots of different kind of um subgroups um you know but if if that's what they actually wanted they want to i'd actually really be deeply sympathetic to that. i think it's kind of a cool nationhood project and maybe we should try and help facilitate facilitate that, that. um mm-hmm. you know i mean uh, but but actually you know they're not they're trying to impose you know racial categorization and caste um onto the broader australian um uh, community and culture and system of governance and you know my response is piss off <laughs> mate uh yeah look uh, i i'm again i don't know how to you know uh, overcome Indigenous disadvantage in Australia. Um, we've seen that many, many different races, cultures, colours who, you know, have historically been, um, you know, had the odds stacked against them, have been successful and integrated well. 
Um, obviously, the history with Indigenous Australians is a bit rougher than, you know, more recent migrants. Um, I guess I'm confident in the long term, but I really, you know, I don't see the the sort of uh, culture warriors in the capitals. Um, you know, you got to be out on the street, really. Um, so I want to. I'm not confident up... in, in the long term. You know, I mean, You're I not. think. Oh, we, interesting. We, we, well, not in terms of indigenous um advancement like I, i'd love to be um i don't see it moving in the right direction you know we see um these kind of differences um persist globally um among disadvantaged groups um i don't think it's going in the right direction i think um you know a, a lot of this conversation is really around um you know a lot of the discourse about lying in the pockets of kind of activists and kind mm. of the mm-hmm. top dogs and none of it goes to the abused wives and the raped children and um you know mm-hmm. all the awful things that go on and so you know i wish there were a way to lift that up and and you know i really hope i'm wrong but it's not obvious to me um that there's reason for a great deal of optimism even on like a 50 or 100 year view interesting interesting yeah, look, uh, I I have absolutely no certainty on this. I think I'm just defaulting to my optimistic view of yeah. the future. Well, and, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and fingers crossed that there are people in these communities with ideas who can who can be given some resources to experiment. And I think that's again one of my overarching principles is that experimentation is is what you need because we don't know the right answer till we've tried it. I, I, I just think historically, you know, technology is the lever, um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and technology kind of coupled with cities, kind of coupled with folks coming with ideas, but, you know, technology is the output that kind of drives advancement. Um, and there's something structural about um, you know, Indigenous desires to kind of live in this limbo land between what they used to be versus kind of modernity mm-hmm. and in regional areas, which is structurally anti-technology um, and advancement in that way, which kind of makes it difficult. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I guess maybe the... the underlying my view is that eventually everyone will interbreed and move to the cities <laughs> and maybe yeah, that's a, that's two, a controversial that's view i mean two. that was kind of that's kind of what i was what i was applying earlier you know maybe it's impossible to region maybe we just need to integrate you know everyone into cities but that's like you know and maybe that is the answer i don't know but it seems closer to the answer than, than what we have today but that would be a deeply kind of controversial view today you know what i mean yeah, well, there's a lot of those things today are controversial um, that used to be, you know, very frank discussions you might want to have. Um, I guess I want to finish up speaking of the future. Uh, I noticed you had a, a birthday this week. I can see the balloons still in the background. Yep. There. Happy birthday, <laughs> Michelle. Thank you. And what's, you know, I think you tweeted, you know, what should I do differently with my life now? And hmm. I guess I wanted to ask you what like where is where is your thinking going now you're writing you're reading about leaders and wartime mm. you you got me onto a book I think last year um about the US military build up in the second world war That was really good did you read it Freedom's Forge I think was the one That's yeah right. and it just as an economist if there's any economists listening um if you want to understand how to radically increase productivity uh, in a just a few year period, like like radically. I think the U.S. build up, they had higher um, you know private household consumption at the end of the military build up than the beginning because the economies of scale, the mass production. Um, I, I believe they built the biggest building in the world because they decided, well, if we can mass produce cars, we can do it with planes and ships as well. Uh, unfortunately, we need a building because if there's a storm, all the half-built planes will you know, tip over. Um, we just now have to build the biggest building in the world. <laughs> and they did. And they had a lot of just gung-ho you know, laborers who'd become builders, who'd become you know, <laughs> construction managers of these mega projects. So that that was amazing. Um, and I, I guess I can I, I can feel the vibe of thinking big, right? New cities, if, if the US could you know, double domestic consumption and have the war build up in five years. 
what's holding us back as a society is really our belief and our dedication to to doing something. But I just wanted to, you know, you, you've got some really interesting stuff happening on your Substack about uh, all sorts of different things. What's 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 your latest interest? What's driving you, and and what's how's it changed your views? Um. So I guess. Yeah, I mean, my um, so on, on your on your war example, I mean, I think that period in time where the US, you know, led the world basically going from buggies to man on the moon within a single generation, you know, mm. why can't we replicate that? I think it's a deep question mm-hmm. that I don't have the answer yeah. to, but that, that kind of goes back to our stagnation question. Um, I think, you know, what's driving me like I'm in a pretty good cadence. You know, my kids are young, taking up a lot of time. I love my job and I'm an investor. That's taking up, you know, a lot of most of my time, obviously. Um, my Substack has been a really important little addition on the side where basically I write about things I read because that's my principal kind of fuel. Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, a lot of that's been kind of American history, but, you know, a lot of it comes, and World War II, I guess, a lot of it comes down to, you know, ideas about, um power and charisma and um you know uh how individuals basically you know kind of wrap the world and change the universe around them you know that that, again freedom's forge was was about the u.s government kind of doing this unbelievable build-up it was also about specific individuals um that actually made it happen which which was remarkable and so um and, and so you know like there's no kind of rhyme or reason to the things I write about or read about okay. um frankly you know like I, I wrote a four-part series about the the domestication of man and and wife economics and you know a lot of that was about the things I read but it was just observations um around me so to be honest it's just like a, a personal cadence you know I, I don't I'm not really a big goals guy I'm kind of a, a systems guy so like um you know keeping fit it's not about going to the gym or I don't go to the gym but like swimming tomorrow or going for a cycle tomorrow it's about cycling all the time you know or you know i, I work and i kind of I, I like the cadence of work and I, I love the cadence of reading and writing because that's just a thing mm-hmm. that will will persist and you know being a dad is just a thing that kind of persists so um i don't know how i'm going to adjust my life over the next um little while i think i'm doing my best you know i've got three kids and um you know i've got a pretty hectic job and i guess filling in you know i i find my sub stack you know deeply rewarding and being able to share it with folks you know such mm-hmm. as yourself and kind of then you know chat about books and ideas and stuff is is deeply rewarding but um to be honest there's no there's no master plan interesting and uh, i guess then let me finish uh, uh you've got your particular insights on the world is there any predictions you think uh about the next five year period that people seem to be unaware of something you really think is likely to happen um i know some people fear war with China or, or an escalation in Ukraine, but is there just something we're overlooking about the next little period that, you know, because for me generally um, my, 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 my system's view of life is that uh, change happens very slowly than all at once. And, and some of this all at once will come and no one will have expected it, whether that's, you know, we saw with mobile phones in a five year period completely change the world i don't know who saw that coming but things like you know i i I have hope for getting this uh uh, mars project i think nasa and other space agencies they want to have a moon base to start launching to mars all that sort of stuff i I, yeah i hope all that happens but uh you know do you have any predictions or or hopes of the next five years for society yeah i mean in some respects five years is a really short amount of time you know i reckon five years ago I already had my first born and what's happened in the last five years, only kind of shocks like COVID really have changed yeah. stuff, but like nothing, it's actually a pretty short amount of time. So, um, and look, I, I don't really pretend to have any deep, um, deep insights. I think, uh, you know, structurally Australia and the U S are really well positioned energy, food independent and, you know, water borders. Um, so I think like just structurally, um, you know, geopolitically, we're well positioned. China's not invading us or anyone, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're a menace in, in some respects. And, you know, I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I think um, the Chinese Communist Party are an enemy. Um, but, um, but, you know, we are not 
you know, remotely threatened in, in, in the near term uh, by them in terms of uh, military. Mm -hmm. I'm skeptical of Mars. You know, hopefully it'd be kind of kind of cool, but like, you know, we can't even make the Australian desert bloom, let alone um, Mars uh, far away. So hopefully, you know, I'm kind of positive on on kind of closer space things, you know, space manufacturing for particular goods, and um, yeah. you know, like zero gravity manufacturing, which, which seems pretty interesting, and and, and other um kind of space economy things and, and and you know maybe over a longer time period that kind of leads to humanity expanding across the universe which would be awesome who knows but i think that's way beyond like a yeah. five year, year year purview obviously um what i mean i think i think you know on the on the scale of the of the iphone i think um the ai thing's kind of real this is not kind of an original insight in the least in fact nothing i've said is very original but like but the but you know the um the, i i think um chat gpt and that you know i think the, the the productivity boost um and kind of workflow automation um is already like you know a few months after its release pretty meaningful and i think that that will um you know continue mm. On the level of the iPhone, not like you know yeah. asteroid hitting the Earth, but on the level of the iPhone, should be pretty pre pretty meaningful, I think. So, um, yeah, beyond that, um, you know, our job as investors is often to kind of um, is to peer into the future and take a view, mm -hmm. but usually they're kind of more directional bets, and you kind of have to be very specific. You know, one doesn't take a you know a, a view on inflation, how inflation helps a business, for example, or, or um, or uh, you know much more, or, or the direction you know the movements in, in, in technology directionally rather than being too specific, you know, be too specific. Or um, so um, so yeah, those are probably my, my, yeah. The, the things that come to mind. Look, that's that's a great way to end, Misha. Uh, really appreciate your thoughts on on this. I, there's a few few overlaps we have, and um, a few very interesting. Um, perspectives on the thinking big the little hong kong um all those sorts of things that you know although i think i you know have out of the box ideas sometimes um i've never really thought about that in the in the slightest so i'm definitely going to um, update my thinking there uh appreciate you giving us the time uh where where can people find you misha if they want to you know read more um, about your thoughts so i mean my my kind of deep this most serious um place and still can be you know wistful and, and, and hopefully funny and, and fun is probably my sub stacks that's kvetch k-v-e-t-c-h i think <laughs> um <laughs> uh, uh the .com. so that's probably where you can kind of the weekly or or fortnightly cadence of kind of more more longer form stuff um if you just want to hear me just kind of shoot my mouth off uh then on twitter <laughs> with at misha m-i-s-h-a underscore um soul s-a-u-l um and you, you can find me there